Hi, welcome back to Humanistic Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the fifth one in a series on Carl Rogers and more specifically on his most famous work, which is on becoming a person. And more specifically yet, this video will focus on chapter three out of that book. So in the last video, we actually got through all of chapter two. And uh, so the goal for this video is to make it all the way through chapter three. So title of chapter three, characteristics of the helping relationship. Now let's remember what I said in the last video that each one of these chapters as we go through them is going to focus a little bit more intently on what psychotherapy from a humanistic psychological point of view actually looks like. So in this video, once again, he's sort of narrowing the focus a little bit more on what he calls the helping relationship, which of course is another way of trying to uh, reconfigure and reconceive the fundamental vocabulary we use to think about psychological suffering in a way that moves it away somewhat from the medical model and toward a much more ontologically oriented way of thinking about it. So two parts to this chapter. The first part has to do with a discussion of a whole bunch of research results, many of which come from mainstream psychological research that in Carl Rogers' mind provide a kind of affirmation of what he's saying about the nature of psychotherapy and more specifically the psychotherapeutic relationship. There's a summary, like it says in your notes on page 44, and with one deft and slightly disorienting movement of my wrist, I'm going to pull up up that page onto my laptop and read to you a paragraph from it that summarizes the first half of this chapter. So at the bottom of 44 he says, without trying fully to integrate the findings from these various studies, it can at least be noted that a few things stand out. One is the fact that it is the attitude and feelings of the therapist rather than his theoretical orientation which is important. His procedures and techniques are less important than his attitudes. It is also worth noting that it is the way in which his attitudes and procedures are perceived which makes a difference to the client and that it is this perception which is crucial. Okay, so let me flip back to the notes. All right, so that's his summary statement about uh, the different kinds of research he's looking at in the first half of chapter three that provide a kind of affirmation or confirmation of the validity of his theories. But what I want to focus on mostly is the second half of chapter three because here's where he's once again formulating another numerically oriented list. You know, these darn humanistic psychologists, you know, for all their emphasis on qualitative research, they love their numerically oriented lists. So uh, once again, we find another list. And this one is going to have to do with how to create a helping relationship. So once again, the focus is a little bit more narrow than it was in the previous chapters. It's focusing a little bit more on what a psychotherapeutic relationship actually looks like. So he, uh, uh, he, he forms this list in terms of a series of questions almost to himself. Uh, so uh, he, here's the first one. This is on what? Page 50. Can I be in some way which will be perceived by the other person as trustworthy, as dependable or consistent in some deep sense? So once again, let's repeat that. Can I be in some way which will be perceived by the other person as trustworthy, as dependable or consistent in some deep sense? Okay, a couple things to notice. First of all, the word be is in italics. Once again, the ontological emphasis that, you know, psychotherapy and uh, joining together with someone uh, in their psychological suffering in a way that hopefully moves them beyond their psychological suffering is a matter of a certain kind of being first and foremost. All right. So again, the title of the book on becoming a person. Can I be in some way? It's important to learn to be in a helpful way. It's a matter of a state of being. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing has to do with what trustworthiness is. Okay, so uh, generating an atmosphere of safety, like we said in one of the earlier videos, is very important to a psychotherapeutic relationship. And in turn, being trustworthy 
is important to generating an atmosphere of safety. Okay, so, uh, and the reason why, of course, is if your client doesn't trust you, how is he or she supposed to feel safe around you, safe enough to go to those difficult psychological places uh, along with you? Well, it doesn't make sense if, you, if you're not perceived as trustworthy by the client. Okay, so what is trustworthiness? Now, here he, he takes pains to, I guess, uh, invert perhaps a fairly common way of thinking about trustworthiness, and it goes like this. In our everyday world, often we think that someone's trustworthy if they say the same thing today that they did yesterday that they did a week ago and so on. All right, so they're consistent. Trustworthiness has to do with a kind of uh, consistency. And uh, his idea is that actually that's a complete counterfeit <laughs> of genuine trustworthiness because really what that is is uh, you know, a kind of rigidity. So uh, according to that logic, right, like the trustworthy person is the one that never changes his or her mind regardless of how much evidence there is to the contrary, right? Irrespective of what life is actually showing that person, they're just going to sort of doggedly and dogmatically hold to the same damn perspective and never change their minds or never alter their point of view. That's not trustworthy. That's rigidity. Okay, so um, trustworthiness is something else. Okay, and here's a quote uh, that he has about it. Being trustworthy does not demand that I be rigidly consistent, okay, but that I be dependably real. Okay, so uh, you're allowed to, in fact, like uh, trustworthiness, uh, if you change your mind about something, like that is actually a way of being consistently real, or it can be a way of being uh, consistently real. If you're, if you're willing to adapt your point of view and what you think and what you say as new evidence comes forward, that's the real root of trustworthiness. It's about a faithfulness to reality as reality is unfolding. That's the real center of trustworthiness, not a kind of uh, you know, sort of immutable rigidity over time. I mean, that's not trustworthy at all. You know, if I, like think about it. Like, would you trust someone that just like refuses to change his or her mind irrespective of how much reason there is to change his or her mind? I wouldn't, but then again, I'm a little bit of a rebel. You probably figured that out in these videos by now. Okay, so number two, uh, can I be expressive enough? Can I be, like he's problematizing this in the way he puts it. Can I be expressive enough as a person that what I am, ontological emphasis, will be communicated more or less unambiguously. All right, so the thing about expressiveness, and maybe you've noticed this, is that not all human beings have this in equal measure, okay? Like some people are more directly expressive than others, and, uh, you know, but for him, one of the attributes of a good therapist is to be fairly expressive, all right? So now, here he says something really beautiful um, about what being expressive really takes, what's necessary to be expressive. He, he goes, um, to do this requires one's forming and accepting, helping relationship to oneself. Oh, wait, I thought this was all about helping the client. Well, it is about helping the client, but you're never going to be able to help the client if at some level you're not also helping yourself grow as a human being. Oh, and then he says, here's the icing on the cake, and he calls this the most difficult task I know. Okay, so let's connect the dots here for a second. So for him, the most difficult task he knows is to form an, an accepting, helping relationship to ourselves rather than a judgmental, self-sabotaging relationship to ourselves. And here, I think the validity of this insight uh, revolves around your being able to uh, perceive that <laughs> for the most part we're our own worst enemies, right? Like the enemies that you have in this life are the people that you think are your enemies. Yeah, they can mess up your life and piss you off in various ways, but when you think about <clears throat> the ways in which we ourselves 
mess up our own lives, well, your enemies can't do nearly as much to you as you can do to your own life. If you really want to look up, look for the source of how your life is messed up and doesn't work and is non-functional, don't look to your enemies first and foremost. Look because your enemies will come and go with life. Look to yourself because that's really the root of it all. Okay, so uh, number three. Can I let myself, once again problematizing it, can I let myself experience positive attitudes toward the other person? And at first it seems like probably, wow, well th that seems like an easy slam dunk, expressing uh, uh, positive attitudes and experiencing positive attitudes toward other people. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. And the reason why is because um, and maybe you've discovered this, even though you're young, most of you watching this are young, in your young lives, it's like the more uh, you have a positive attitude somewhat towards someone, the more they can let you down. All right. So if you have a positive attitude, let's say toward your friends, the more they can disappoint you if they do something you don't like. The more, in a way, the more positive attitude you have toward people, the more they can hurt you. And uh, boy, you know, if you need a real confirmation of that, look to the domain of love relationships, you know, intimate love relationships where probably, you know, you're more vulnerable and uh, you have more positive attitudes at the same time toward another human being. And boy, if you want to find a place in life that can really tear you up and beat you up, and leave you broken and bloody, look to the domain of love relationships because there are very few places in life that can do all of those kind of unpleasant things more than love relationships. So when you really have positive attitudes and you, you say you're in love with someone, man, they can just like destroy you <laughs> like in a hurry. And the reason why is because when you have that much positive attitude, along with it comes a certain range of vulnerability. Okay, a certain range of openness to being in love, a certain range of vulnerability in being in love. And, you know, when you're that vulnerable, you're also that vulnerable to being hurt. So that's not a reason not to fall in love or not have friends, but it's a way of recognizing the reality that, you know, having friends and being in love is a risky thing. You know, life is a risky thing for that matter, but this particular part of life is what we're focusing on. So having positive feelings in a way can be a kind of challenge because, you know, it's sort of the more you like someone, the more they can hurt you, the more they can let you down. So, um... If you want to stay safe as possible in this life, never have a friend, never have a lover, right? So if your fundamental project is to be sort of as safe and as, uh, um, like what, invulnerable <laughs> to uh, the predations of other people, like never have a positive attitude towards someone. Always stay in a safe, cynical posture toward other people, right? Like a cynical, spectating posture because that posture will already sort of foreclose the question of whether you have positive attitudes or not because you're too cynical to have a positive attitude towards someone. And it's okay, yeah, you stay safe that way, but at what cost? At what cost? And I would argue that the cost is very, very high to move through your entire life in a safe, spectating, cynical relation to other people that you lose probably, what, 60% of your life that way. Okay, but that's just me, all right? Number four. Okay, the next two ha are, are about a kind of tension, and it's a little bit paradoxical tension. And so when I read number four at first, it may seem like, wow, that doesn't sort of comport very well with <laughs> these other videos. So number four is, can I be strong enough as a person to be separate from the other? Okay, and the reason why I said that maybe that might be a little counterintuitive is, because probably you think with all this talk about empathy and understanding the client's world through the client's eyes and all of this kind of stuff that it really, therapy is really about a kind of proximity, right? It's not about being separate from the other. It's about being very close to the other. Well, here's the deal about that. It's not, uh, being close to your client doesn't mean that you are sort of, um, uh, sort of homogeneously fused with your client so that there's no division between who your client is and who you are, right? Because that's probably not going to be helpful. Why is that not helpful? Because you're not going to be able to offer enough difference from the client's world, right? If you're just sort of like fusively mixed in with the client somehow, 
you know, you're not going to be able to offer the kind of uh, critical distance that'll be the occasion for the clients seeing something other than what the client already sees. Okay, so can you be strong enough as a person to be separate from the other? So the balance is between being empathetic, that's true, empathetic, but still being yourself. Okay, so that's a tricky balance, a little bit of a tricky balance. It's a balance between being close and distant in a way at the same time. And it's like, oh my God, we're almost in Zen Cohen territory, you know, so you, ha you need to be close, but you need to be distant enough and strong enough to be distant enough to still be your own person, all right? Despite the fact that you're being empathetic at the same time. So it's about a tricky and somewhat paradoxical kind of balance rather than just be as close and consequently as sort of fusively intermixed with your client as possible because that's not really helpful. So number five, I said the next two are sort of going to be about this same balance. Am I secure enough within myself to permit him his separateness? Okay, so once again, the theme of separateness. So a quote about this, can I permit him, the client, to be what he is? Honest or deceitful, infantile or adult, despairing or overconfident, can I give him the freedom to be? Okay, once again, ontological emphasis. You're probably getting sick of hearing me say that, but... Uh, that's good if you're getting sick, because that means you really get it enough to be sick. Okay, so uh, can I be secure within myself to permit? Can I permit the client to be the client? All right, now here's the thing about that. Um, practically every human being on this planet is going to have things that you like and things that you don't like. There are very few human, few human beings that you like every single thing about this person all the time, and very few uh, human beings that you simply dislike every single thing about this person all the time. There may be one or two, okay? But most people, it's like you certain things you like, certain things you don't like. So um, the things that you don't like <laughs> are uh, what are going to be the challenge to allow the client to be the client. Right? So when the client does things like some of these things he's talking about, like if the client is deceitful, like you know the client is lying, right? Can you still allow the client to be the client without sort of getting on your horse and feeling like you have to, uh, you know, provide some kind of logical refutation of the, <laughs> the fallaciousness of his assertions or some damn thing like that, you know? Uh, is the client infantile or childish? Because maybe you don't like that when people sort of regress to an infantile type state. Uh, is the client uh, cocky and overconfident? You know, like, is the client full of himself? Well, some of your clients are going to be. So the question is going to be, are, are you uh, strong enough to let the client be the client? Right? Because if you're not strong enough in who you are, you're going to have a real challenge with letting other people be what they are. Right? Because you'll feel the reason why is because, like, um, if you're not strong enough in who you are, you'll feel a kind of uh, um, uh, anxiety about whether other people's presence is providing a confirmation of you or not. All right, and you'll be seeking out that kind of confirmation. But if you're strong enough, you won't need that kind of confirmation. You getting it? You can let other people be what they are because you don't need them to confirm your way of being. Why? Because you're already strong enough in your way of being. Okay. Number six. You are number six. Can I let myself enter fully into the world of his feelings and personal meanings and see these as he does? Okay. Can I step into his private world so completely that I lose all desire to evaluate or judge it. Okay, so in the last video, I was talking a little bit about how empathy and acceptance are connected. And remember, I gave you an example of, you know, if your friend pisses you off and you're all in a snit about it and all of that, and later you find out that, well, that your friend was that way because his dog died, like having that empathetic understanding can all of a sudden make it a lot easier to accept the behavior, let's say, of your friend who wasn't maybe uh, completely considerate while he was in his misery because his dog died. This is kind of a very similar thing. Can I step into his private world? Can you be empathetic enough so that you lose all desire to be judging and evaluating it, okay, and pinning it on some kind of hierarchy like, oh, good person, bad person, I like you, I don't like you, you're right, you're wrong, and so on and so forth. That. Can you enter into the empathetic experience so deeply that that 
desire to judge in all kinds of very, and by the way, very human ways, we all do this in various ways, that that becomes, that sort of drifts off or dissolves somehow, and that the empathetic spontaneity of the moment is the thing that's holding sway. Okay, so let's, let me read it again. Can I step into the, his private world so completely that I lose all desire to evaluate or judge it? You get it? So like, the more empathetic you are, it's going to help with your ability to accept your client. Okay, number seven. Can I accept, I put in parentheses so it's not a direct quote, each facet of this other person which he presents to me? Can I receive him as he is? Can I communicate this attitude? Okay, hopefully at this point you're starting to get the sense that, hey, some of these items on this list are starting to sound like they're saying the same thing. They are, okay? There's a reason. They are. They're, they're getting at the same thing from slightly different angles, but they're getting at the same thing. This is why I told you in what, I think it was the one or two videos ago that reading and understanding Carl Rogers is a little bit different from the other material in this class. There's not as much sort of straight rote memory stuff and like understanding vocabulary phrases and all of that kind of stuff. It's more about sort of getting the gestalt, getting the general picture or pattern of his approach to psychotherapy. So, um, Bear that in mind. All right. So if you start to detect, wow, it's kind of saying the same thing, that's actually a good sign. That's not a bad sign because maybe you th might think, oh, I'm not really getting this because, like, uh, I kind of have the sense that he sort of already said that. That's actually a good sign. Okay. All right. Number eight. Can I act with sufficient? Uh, let's repeat that. Can I act with sufficient sensitivity in the relationship that my behavior will not be? perceived as a threat. Okay, so insensitivity and judgmentalism are the main sources of threat in that very critical early stage of psychotherapy that has to do with establishing an atmosphere of safety. Okay, safety and trust. Huge. It's hard to overemphasize how huge that is, especially in the, it's, it's huge throughout therapy, but especially in the beginning stages where people are sort of teetering and, uh, you know, there still is a stigma associated with going to a therapist. The reason why is because, um, you know, you're sort of admitting that you're weak, that you're hurting, that you're vulnerable, that you're in pain and so on and so forth. And there's still a little bit of, uh, I would say the vestiges of a kind of machismo that run, has run through our culture for a long time that says, well, you know, you should be sort of, you should just buck up, you know, and sort of um, be able to handle your own life. Well, you know, that's not necessarily a bad ideal for some fraction of your life, but then again, life's going to beat you up sometimes. Life's going to hurt you sometimes, and it's going to hurt you hard enough where you're going to need a helping hand every now and then, and that's, that doesn't make you a bad person. Okay, that you need a helping hand every now and then. That doesn't make you a charity case either, that you need some help. We all need some help every now and then, you know? The only question is whether we're going to admit it or not. Okay, so um, let's see, where were we? We were on number eight. So can I act with sufficient sensitivity in the relationship that my behavior will not be perceived as a threat? So being sensitive helps generate that atmosphere of safety. Understanding your client helps generate that atmosphere of safety. Not being judgmental about your client or being judgmental as little as possible, let's put it that way because it's an ideal, is going to be conducive to that atmosphere of safety. So number nine, can I free him from the threat of external evaluation? Okay, so judgmentalism always bears some sort of threat. Now he says something a little bit interesting under this one and once again a little bit counterintuitive he goes curiously enough a positive evaluation is as threatening in the long run as a negative one and it's like well yeah but don't we all like to be complimented don't we all like to sort of you know get a little applause every now and then or cheerleading yay you know that sort of thing and uh roger's observation is that well that too is threatening and the reason why it's threatening is because the subtext is saying what's going on here is you're being judged. It's just that you happen to get a positive judgment today. But if what's going on here is you're being judged, who knows about tomorrow? You know? So the real threat is the message that says it's about judging you. Okay, this is about judging you. 
So in a way, when you give a positive judgment, like I judge the positively, you know, sort of thing, that's still, it, okay, it feels good to most people because it's there's a certain degree of ego gratification there, but it still conveys the message that what's going on here is you're being judged. <laughs> right? So you better watch out because next week you might not be so lucky. And finally, number 10, this is a list of 10, so we're getting to the end of this list. Can I meet this other individual as a person who is in the process of becoming O-M-G-R-O-F-L there it is again, the ontological emphasis. See, I told you you're going to get sick of it. You're going to need a Dramamine any second to get through these videos. Or, okay, so let's restart that. Can I meet this other individual as a person who is in the process of becoming, or will I be bound by his past and by my past? Okay, so here the emphasis is on um, opening ourselves to the spontaneously creative therapeutic moment. All right. It's not just about um, sort of color by numbers. Remember those color by numbers books when you were a kid? They sort of said, you know, uh, pull out your green crayon and color the green, the grass green. Okay. Pull out your blue crayon and color the sky blue. It's not about that, like sort of stuff you know that's driven by past habits, either the client's past habits or your own past habits, like your own knowledge about what the client has been through in your life. It's not just about repeating that because people are only going to change when they reach the outer limits of who and what they are in something like a spontaneous and unpredictably creative moment wherein they can begin to reconfigure their lives, their thinking, their meanings, their feelings, their values, their behaviors. And that requires something like a moment of discontinuity, a sharp moment of discontinuity with respect to all of the inertial force of people's past thinking, past habits, what they've done in the past, past values, and so on and so forth. That it's, it's going to take something like a moment, the world has to stop. You getting it? The client's world has to stop so that a new world can be born. And it will only stop if it's not being continually propelled by all of the momentum from the past. Okay, so something like a spontaneous creative moment in the eternal now has to happen. And that can be a, uh, a difficult thing, not just for the client, but also for the therapist who's riding right alongside the client. That's not necessarily an easy thing to live through, but it is an essential thing to live through. Okay, so this brings us to the end of chapter three. In the next video, we're gonna dig into not chapter four, but chapter five, a little bit, once again, narrowing the focus a little bit on what this therapy looks like. But until then, have a great day. Bye-bye.